Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. The new year is around the corner, which gives us an opportunity to take inventory of 2020 as well as look forward to 2021. And I cannot recommend enough Douglas Wilson's productivity. Make 2021 the most productive year so far. Get it today at canonpress.com. So welcome to the Plodcast. This is, believe it or not, episode 174. Plodcast, episode 174. I wanted to begin talking uh, today about the problem that faces many many families as they are considering where they want to live. A lot of people are thinking about uh, relocations, and this is really understandable when you consider how badly governed certain parts of our country are. And I'm thinking of places like Illinois and New York State and California and and Washington. And then it's compounded oftentimes by extraordinarily corrupt municipal governments, whether it's uh, uh, Seattle or Portland or, you know, Chicago, New York City. A lot of Christian families are considering something that they would have thought perhaps was unthinkable just a few years ago, and, and that would be, should we move somewhere? Should we, uh, should we find somewhere in Heartland America that where, the, where things are not quite so insane? Now, the first thing to caution you about is that you will find the current insanity that has gripped our generation is not utterly absent anywhere. Uh, so, you're, you're going to be able to find some of the crazy everywhere you go. In some places, the crazy dominates, and it, it's just overwhelming. And uh, if you are a believer, and you've been reading your Bible, and you've been attending worship, uh, it's sort of like you've been, um, you were put into, when you started going to church and started reading your Bible, and started taking your family to worship on a regular basis, it's, it's like you put your whole family into a time capsule. And uh, in the year 2020 is when they opened it up and you came out of the time capsule to see what happened to everybody around you. Well, of course, you're appalled and you think, well, what, sh- what should I do? Where, where should, should we move? And uh, what I wanted to do is spend just a few minutes talking about uh, some of the criteria that I think that you should take into account when you are thinking about moving away from somewhere and as you're considering a place to move to. And like the realtors say, this is all about location, location, location. But what makes a location a location? When you're considering moving away from a particular place, that should be the result of certain deficiencies in these areas that I'm going to talk about. And if you're considering moving to somewhere, to a particular place, uh, it ought to be because something uh, or certain characteristics in these areas I'm going to talk about are attractive. So, I'll begin with uh, worship. Begin with a worshiping community. Uh, You need, you and your family need to be part of a church that honors God, worships God as though they honor God, and who take his word seriously. They fear God in how, and and this is evident in how the, the word of God is handled from the pulpit and how the elders of the church govern the church in the light of the word, include things like church discipline uh, and things like not um, carefully dancing around uh, certain controversial topics or the church avoiding the practice of embracing certain controversial uh, topics, but in a way that shows that they're going along with the zeitgeist. So, worship, basically, uh, the top priority, I think, for Christian families ought to be a sound and a healthy Orthodox, cheerful church. So if you have that where you are, and all sorts of other things are bad, that should be at least a an anchor that makes you think twice. Uh, if you don't have it where you are, then and you're thinking of um, moving on, you should prioritize. Number one, you should prioritize a place where there's a worshiping community that you can join and be uh, part of happily. That's so. That's the first criteria. If you're thinking, criterion, excuse me, 
If you're thinking of going somewhere, is your uh, membership in a church going to be at the same level or better than uh, what you have now? The second priority that I think you should have has to do with the education of your children. If you have children uh, of school age, then you you want to move somewhere where their education options are the same as or better than what they currently enjoy. Is there a sound, uh, rigorous Christian school where you're going? Uh, Or if you're homeschooling or you're doing Logos online or something like that, uh, do they have a do they have a good internet connection so you can keep doing what you've been doing? Education, uh, the education of your children uh, would be the next priority. What is what's the worship like where you're thinking about going? Can you educate your children in a God honoring way uh, where you're going? Uh, third would be uh, family, and by family I'm talking about uh, extended family. All right, so. I think you ought to uh, prioritize uh, generational connectedness. Are you are you going to a place where uh, your kids can be connected to your parents? Are you? And this is, of course, everything else being equal. Uh, There are sometimes some cases where this is simply uh, impossible because your your folks have gone to be with the Lord, or they live in a remote part of New Zealand as missionaries, or you know whatever. But everything else being equal. You should want to be connected to your people. Uh, so that means if you are moving away from a place where your, your parents are nearby and you're moving to a place where they're not going to be nearly as close, that should be a factor that weighs heavily on you. If it weighs on you, it ought to. That, that doesn't settle your decision for you, but it just means it should be factored in. The fourth uh, thing that I would uh, say, the fourth criterion, would be uh, vocational opportunities, job opportunities for the provider of the household, the the father and the husband of the household. And this is, you notice the order I've, I've is somewhat uh, different than what often happens. What often happens is a man gets a job offer. It'd be great for his career. He moves there and then they wonder, hey, is there a church or is how we're going to educate the kids? And that question arises when they're unpacking the boxes. It ought not, it ought not to be that way. So I would say worship first, education of your children second, connectedness to your people uh, third, and vocational opportunities fourth. I think that that's roughly speaking what the priorities ought to be. Uh, one other thing about uh, about making decisions like this, there are three considerations that you should take into account. Uh, Picture a circle, and within the circle is uh, the will of God as expressed for all Christians, and outside the circle is the not the will of God for any Christian. So, if it's outside the circle, then God prohibits it for everybody. You don't have to pray about whether to become a cocaine cocaine dealer or, or a hitman for the mafia. It's out of the will of God. You don't have to pray about uh, breaking your word on a contract you signed. You don't have to pray about marrying a non-Christian. God says not to do that. So that's outside the circle. Inside the circle is something that's permissible, that's within his will for any Christian. But then you have the question of what is his specific will for me and for my household, for me and my family. Uh, and that that question is, I think, answered as a matter of wisdom, not a matter of uh, obedience. So. Uh, you can't sin against God by taking this job as opposed to that one. You can sin against wisdom, if, if that makes sense. You, you can make an unwise choice, uh, and within the circle, if God permits it, within the circle, if it's a lawful decision to make, your goal should be uh, that of uh, making uh, a wise decision. And the three criteria for making a wise decision, I would say, are what are your abilities? What are your opportunities and what are your desires? What can you do? What are they going to let you do? And what do you want to do? And if it's within God's purpose and plan for any Christian, uh, then you make the, a wise decision based on those criteria. What are your abilities? What are your opportunities? What are your desires? And when you consider the previous things, uh, worship and education for your kids and, and connectedness to family and, and your your own vocational future, 
uh, those two sets of questions can be meshed. Hamartiology. And this is, of course, Hamartiology for episode 174. We've already looked at the verb for murmuring, which was gangutso, gangutso, which was a great word. Our word this time is related to that one, that word being gangusmos, which means murmuring or grudging, murmuring or grudging. The ministry of the Lord Jesus made him a polarizing figure. It was necessary for people to respond to him one way or the other. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't easy to be neutral or apathetic about Jesus. Some saw him clearly as a good man, but others dismissed him as a deceiver. Uh, in John seven twelve, it says, And there was much murmuring, there's our word, and there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, he's a good man, others said, nay, but he deceiveth the people. Now, the way this initially sounds, John appears to be telling us that this murmuring was general, sort of across the board, with two factions contributing to it. But given human nature, I think it more likely that the people who thought Christ was a deceiver were the ones who had something to complain about, and hence were the ones murmuring, while the others were simply those who replied to the complaint. The problem of murmuring arose in the early days of the Christian church also. We see that in Acts 6, 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring, there's our word, a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. These were probably all Jews, uh, the Grecians and the Hebrews um, both, with the Grecians or the Hellenists being the Greek-speaking Jews. So, um, the population of Jerusalem had swollen because of the festival of Pentecost, and then the number of the converted pilgrims who stayed over uh, because of the great miracle at Pentecost kept it at that swollen uh, level. The Greek-speaking widows, or the Hellenistic widows, came to be neglected in the distribution of food, and the result was a sinful murmuring about it. The apostles resolved the disputing with an adjustment in their church polity. You recall that in Acts 6, they uh, had the people select some men to serve to, to oversee this, uh, which many take and I take as the establishment of the first diaconate. Uh, and then the apostles laid hands on them, and they, they were given to that work. And uh, because the apostles resolved this problem in a biblical, godly, God-honoring way, the church continued to grow. Uh, we know that this kind of thing, this kind of grumbling or murmuring, is sinful because the Apostle Paul flatly prohibits it at all times and under all circumstances. Uh, he says in Philippians 2.14, Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Do all things without murmuring or disputing. And the Apostle Peter knows where one of our temptations will reside when it comes to this. He tells us to guard ourselves against this kind of muttering in our practice of hospitality. It frequently happens that guests do not do their part. They are ungrateful or not grateful enough, or there are too many of them, or somebody had mud on their shoes. You know, something. Peter says in 1 Peter 4 9, use hospitality one to another without grudging. That word grudging is our, is our word, uh, gan gusmas. So, continuing on with episode 174 of the podcast, the book I want to review uh, this time is a book I just recently enjoyed, uh, and it's a book by Jerry Bowyer, and it's called The Maker Versus The Takers. The Maker versus the takers. Now, uh, this, this was a delightful book, and I'm going to begin by comparing it to another book that, that gave me a very similar experience that I had with this one. So, I grew up on Narnia. I, a good part of my childhood was spent in Narnia. I've been reading those books for 60 years. Oh, and I've read them over and over, and I can t continue to go back to them. So, I loved Narnia uh, and spent a lot of del many del delightful hours uh, in Narnia. So I knew my I knew my way around around that uh, world fairly well. Uh, and then a number of years ago, I had the experience of reading uh, Michael Ward's book Planet Narnia, which I think I've reviewed in um, an earlier podcast. Um, and Planet Narnia basically uh, cracks the Narnian code. Uh, there are seven Narnia books, and 
uh, Michael Ward shows, I think, demonstrates conclusively that each one of the Narnia books corresponds to one of the one of the planets. Um, so, for example, the horse and his boy corresponds to Mercury. The magician's nephew corresponds to Venus. Uh, Prince Caspian corresponds to uh, Mars, and so on. Uh, the last battle to Saturn. Uh, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe to Jove. Uh, the silver chair to the moon. Uh, the voyage of the dawn treader to the sun. I think I got them all. And uh, and Ward demonstrates it. It's not just like he got a, a crazy thought and he thought, hey, seven books, seven planets. Uh, he demonstrates conclusively how each one of the books is dominated by that, by by the tropes and images and things associated with that planet. Here's this is the experience I had. So I was thoroughly familiar with the Narnia books. And then I read Michael Ward and everything. Uh, it's like I had been watching a movie that I loved and I was nearsighted or something or some, the, it was out of focus. And then after having watched it a number of times, someone ha- said, hey, let me adjust the lens. And all of a sudden, I watched this movie that I had loved for years and everything was in focus and I could, and I could see. And also, all of a sudden, I noticed all kinds of new details as a result. So that that's the experience I had. Planet Narnia did that for me uh, with regard to Narnia. This book, The Maker and the Takers, I had a very similar sensation reading this book. I've been a Bible reader for many, many, many years and read the Gospels over and over again. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, the accounts of Christ, all of the, the famous interactions and so on uh, that the Lord had. And I've read a lot of theology and a lot of uh, commentaries and a lot of comments that people have said about Jesus and his famous clashes with different people. And um, this book, uh, The Maker Versus the Takers, pointed out some things that are, once you think about them, once it's pointed out to you, are sort of stinking obvious. And other things that he points out, you just had no way of knowing uh, until until someone informed you, not to keep you in suspense any further. This is the basic uh, uh, argument that uh, Boyer makes. And that is, we sometimes skim over uh, where people are from, uh, Galilee or Judea or Samaria. Most people understand that there was tension between the Jews and the Samaritans because that's pretty, that's inescapable. And the, you, if, you're, if you're a Bible reader, you know that Galileans had a distinctive accent and, and so on. But Boyer points out that all of the Lord's collisions with uh, his, where he's denouncing wealth are collisions that happen in Judea. Now, for example, if I were to tell you that the two richest counties in the United States are Montgomery County in Maryland on one side of Washington, D.C., and the other county, I forget the, I forget the name of it, it's where Arlington is. Uh, the other county on in Virginia on the other side of Washington D.C. and I said those are the if I said those are the two richest counties in uh, the United States, most people would say, well, duh, that's where the federal government is, and that's where that's where all the tax money goes, and uh, it shows. That's see, that's that's what's that's where <laughs> that's the drain everything's going down, right? Uh, well, this book shows that basically the Galileans had an economy that was based on production. And in Judea, there was an economy that was based on uh, taxation and consumption and public works projects, like Herod's temple or, you know, so on. And he, he, he uh, basically, this is an economic, uh, it's not uh, quite an economic commentary, but it's an economic background to the first century, the first century economic life in Palestine that sheds light on all kinds of interactions. So, um, why, why was uh, Pilate, who was normally an irascible governor who detested the Jews and didn't want to do with the Jews, why did he capitulate so easily when they were demanding the crucifixion of the Lord? And he clearly didn't want to do it because, as Boyer shows, um, there was an economic crisis uh, that was uh, roiling Rome at the time in the year 33. And at that time, uh, the man who had gotten Pilate his, um, his appointment uh, there, 
uh, was found to have been uh, committed treason against the emperor Tiberius and was um, beheaded. And uh, so, th as uh, Boyer points out, think of the economic crisis of 2008 and throw in a couple of beheadings of high ranking officials. And that's kind of the tense situation that you've got when the people start demanding the Lord's blood. And, and Pilate, when Pilate shows resistance, they say, well, we're going to tell Caesar, you know, it, um, if, you, if you don't do this, you're no friend to Caesar. Uh, well, his patron had just been executed for being, being no, uh, no friend of Caesar, and that was not, a, not an empty threat. The temple in Jerusalem was also a bank. Rabbi Hillel had, was one of the uh, people who had come up with a workaround where, you know, in the Old Testament law, where uh, all debts were wiped clean every seven years. Uh, Hillel came up with a, um, a workaround that uh, allowed people to sell the debt to the temple. And, and when that happened, the seven years didn't erase anything. Uh, so, basically, the Lord had many, many collisions with what we would call crony capitalism. Crony capitalism, or uh, people who get wealthy because they know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who cut a deal. And all with public money, all with tax money. Um, so this, uh, you, you're going to find uh, fresh insights on every page. Uh, I think that you will. Th there are a few places where I think uh, he overstates his case a little bit, or I, or I differ with it uh, here and there. He, I think he makes too much of um, the fact that Rachel uh, died in Bethlehem and. There was that atrocity in, from the Book of Judges that occurred in Bethlehem. He, he doesn't emphasize enough that it's identified as the city of David. There are certain things like that where I think, okay, I think he um, missed a step here or there. But overwhelmingly, it was uh, one of the best books I read this year. And um, I just encourage you to get it. The Maker versus the Takers, Jerry Boyer. Mm -hmm.